Yeah, I don't either. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Let's see. Yes, Anybody know how to mirror the screen? Trying to get it go. Trying to go across both uh, laptop. Trying to mirror my display. Windows P. Super P. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, I don't have my notes in front of me. It's not going away there. Well, there's nothing. <laughs>
Okay. That is not. Okay. I'm just going to go with that for now. So, um, so this is going to be a pretty high level talk about um, home labs. I'm not going to get into anything very deep, but mainly I'm just going to go over uh, your NAS, and I'm using True NAS, and then uh, Firewall, which I'm using PFSense, and um, and then I'm using Proxmox. So. Um, so I'm Scott Redman. I currently live in uh, East Tennessee, around the Knoxville area. And um, uh, anybody knows that anything around, um, like the Oak Ridge area, we have, there's the top um, number one computer on the top 500 list. And right now they have the number five because Summit's been pushed down a little bit. But yeah, Frontier and Summit Frontier is on a um, raised floor with uh, three feet underneath the floor. Um, summit's on a concrete slab with all the uh, cabling and cooling in, in, is above. Um, if you ever get an opportunity to see those, they're kind of nice to see. Just the infrastructure that goes with those because when they were installing um, Frontier, they actually put extra AC units on the building, I believe, while it was occupied. That might have been during COVID, so maybe it wasn't that occupied. Um, and both of those are running Linux. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery's there. IX Systems has one of their offices there. Um, our user group, uh, ETSA, which used to be Lopsy, East Tennessee, um, we meet monthly there, so it's also there. Um, uh, I've been a Unix sysadmin since 93. Uh, I've done a little bit of storage administration. I've done backup administration. Uh, I was a network admin for a short time, um, and I've done a little bit with firewalls. So, but my focus has always been being a sysadmin. I've touched uh, a little bit of everything. So, um, but the only one I didn't care much for was AIX. If you've ever done anything with AIX, it's totally different. You can do most other Unix, Linux, you can do it from command line. AIX, I'm not sure who's able to do that from command line, but because uh, you can kind of do things through SMIT and then kind of ask it, show me the command you're using, and it's like LS, LPP, this, and it goes for like three or four lines just wrapping around. So um, people that can do that off the top of their head, I mean, that's a different, uh, different kind of people. So... Uh, and then the first free Unix I would have been used was 386 BSD. They actually had articles in Dr. Dobbs discussing um, all the work that they were kind of doing with that. Um, so I did that for a little bit. Um, and that was kind of neat to see that. Um, because the Windows people, you know, were very touchy about their PCs, but I, I would take my PC and kind of just hit the power on it let it come back up and do a file system check, no issues. <clears throat> then in 1993, I did a little bit with FreeBSD and we started getting into some Red Hat and we ran our corporate uh, email servers, like 386s with four mega memory running off. Uh, the first real server that uh, I was in charge of was a proprietary server called an Epic One. And I think their uh, IP was pretty much sold off to EMC, but it was a uh, NFS server with hierarchical storage management. It had two 768 meg SCSI drives, eight mega memory Motorola processor, 
and it used uh, MO optical disc, magneto optical disc, which looked like, um, actually I got a picture. Looks like a three and a half quarter kind of on steroids is what it looks like. But um, we would set that up for staging and hot files would be on our um, magnetic disc, our hard disc. And as those filled up, uh, files would get staged out to the optical disc. And we would keep the first 8K of the uh, file would stay uh, on the hard disk, but the rest of it would get staged out. And um, that, it, it behaved beautifully, but it was a proprietary solution. And here's a picture of some of the different jukeboxes. The uh, tall one there is kind of similar to the HP jukebox that we had. And you have like a mail slot on the front that you use for um, inserting or removing media. Uh, I think those all went out of style, I think after the 90s. I think, uh, but, because uh, you saw you saw a lot of jukeboxes, but not a, there wasn't a software platform for most of them. So, uh, cover all that. So. And, um, I don't know, since I was, Talking about being a sysadmin and everything, I was just going to talk a little bit about the history of Unix before. Um, um, the tool set in the 80s wasn't the greatest. The CC compiler that came with, like, Alteryx, if you got an error in it, it basically tell you you got a line, go look at line 12. And you go look at line 12, there's not an issue there. So, uh, when the Free Software Foundation came out with the GCC and we loaded a beta copy on there, it was much better than uh, anything we'd kind of seen before. So, um, yeah, at the time we were, all of our brand new servers we had were Windows NT and if you look around the data center, if you ever saw a server that was uh, old and clunky or whatever, that was probably something somebody had cobbled together and that was either running NetWare or it was running Linux. So. And, you know, kind of in the 2000s, like Sun started hiring people trying to improve their uh, version of Solaris they had, so they had D-Trace that uh, came out where they could um, put probes and non-intrusively look at your system without causing any performance issues. Um, There's some videos by Brian Cantrell and um, Brendan Gregg where they kind of go over that. Uh, there's a real popular one where, where people, um, where you'd see somebody shouting at a disc and nobody knew why he was shouting at the disk, but when they were shouting at the disk, they could see performance metrics changing. And through their analysis with D-Trace, they found out that there were uh, screw mounts missing in some of their disk that actually caused that issue. And ZFS was born during that time. Uh, and uh, that was around the time that um, Ian Murdoch of Debian was hired to work for Sun. So, and uh, they finally did take all their, uh, all the people they hired and they finally got Solaris 11 out the door, but by the time they did that it was a little bit too late. Uh, everybody kind of moved on to something else and then they were kind of purchased. So, okay, hot lap. Home labs have become real popular. Um, you know, there was a presentation in Ansible Fest 22 in Chicago. Um, that was tough to even get into the um, into the venue to actually see that because it was uh, there wasn't enough space for that. So, and they didn't record that, so nobody got to see that one. The 
uh, home lab presentation at scale earlier this year was in Pasadena, and you can look that up on YouTube. And I kind of recap these later in the presentation. And there's also the Home Lab podcast where they talk about different um, topics with whatever is latest and greatest going on. Then you have the self hosted podcast where they're also discussing um, uh, what's up and coming. So, yeah, here's my home. Lab, my, yeah, I have a router firewall that's PF Sense. Uh, community edition, um, my storage, I do that through TrueNAS as an NFS server, and management on all of my VMs, and uh, I I'm not really doing a lot with the LXC containers, but that's all done via Pro Proxmox VE, and I think Proxmox VE 8 beta was just released yesterday, I believe. And each one of these, they're all GUI-based, um, easy to pick up. Uh, all of them can support ZFS. Proxmox will also support Butter, so you can. So my PFSense, uh, right now it's got eight gig of memory and two SSD drives for the boot. And then it has six 10 gigabit NICs on it. The TrueNAS core, um, I kind of, that was in a previous version of, um, well, I'll go over the history of that too, but yeah, that was a previous version of my Proxmox, and I actually stole the uh, Azus PC from uh, my Proxmox cluster. But it, uh, yeah, it's. 8 gig of memory, it's got the SSD drives, uh, a couple of spinning rust, uh, then I've got gigabit and 1.2 gigabit in it currently. So uh, current lab, I've got Proxmox servers with uh, three super micro servers that I purchased earlier this year. Uh, those came from Unix Surplus eBay. Uh, and I'm doing three nodes since I get HA. Um, 64 gig memories on each node. Um, they've got mirrored SSD drives, and those have four 10 gigabit NICs in them. And all the storage is uh, exported from the uh, True NAS, and they all have the same mount point, so they all see, see the same data. Which is mainly the, uh, mainly virtual disk images, but yeah, the ISOs and uh, hardware-wise, I've got a Raspberry Pi that I'm running Home, home Assistant on it. Uh, I've got another one, I think it's probably the next slide. Um, I've got a pie hole, yeah, I've got a pie hole that's uh, running with Unbound that's doing, uh, providing my local DNS. And, uh, well, I'm using PFSense for that also to manage my own local domain. <coughs> I took my old uh, Netgear router and change that to where that was doing Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, I switched to using, uh, I was, had some Netgear switches, I switched to using these TP-Link SG-108s. Um, they'll do basic VLAN. They're probably not enterprise grade because they're only 30 bucks, so. So, yeah, this is kind of where I start going through the history because uh, originally I just had a gateway PC that I was running Nagios, uh, and that was really just because my internet provider was unreliable and the, um, I kept losing either DNS or I would lose my uh, network connection. 
So when VirtualBox came out, I started moving a lot of stuff to over to VirtualBox. Um, that made things a lot easier to kind of test. And then I had a custom built PC that I was pushing uh, virtuals to to kind of test. And that was a very early version of Fedora Core. So, so I moved to using a kind of a mobile lab. I was using Raspberry Pis. And basically I just had a box of cables that I, any cables I would need with USB, with um, network, everything was USB powered. So you know, I could just grab a small box, had four nodes, and I could take that anywhere I wanted. And I could test anywhere I wanted. Uh, I really didn't need internet or anything else for that. So. Oh yeah, I was using black box, tiny little black box switches that uh, they had a, uh, you can actually attach those to, uh, they had a magnet on them, so you could actually attach those to different, different pieces of, uh, if you had a rack, you could actually attach those. Uh, then yeah, I had a travel, travel router, which was pretty cheap at the time. Um, and it was also could be used for USB charger, so I could just take that and take that anywhere I wanted to. Um, and a portable LCD display, and I had a mini keyboard, and then a, um, a regular size keyboard for uh, because the mini keyboard was tough to type on when you had a lot to type. So. Um, so then I uh, started looking at Proxmox, and Proxmox does KVM. It does um, put the output in QEMU support if you want it. And when you start using it, it is enterprise, enterprise grade. I mean, there are companies that run in that, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of people are, are running that at their home labs because it's so good. So uh, yeah, I was testing out the replication. I was testing out the backup jobs. I was test testing out live migration. The live migration didn't work for me. I'd kind of built the first cluster in uh, pieces. So first I had one network, and then I added a storage network behind that that uh, Proxmox and the NAS could get to, but nothing else. Um, that wasn't attached to a router or anything else, so it was locked down. So, and the nice thing about Proxmox is the markdown note you have, where you can um, uh, put all the uh, configuration management information if you want to. You know your uh, your cluster, what nodes make up your cluster, what uh, kind of hardware you have, and you can provide that also at the node level. And there's also a VM level, so you can um, put all your config management in the different areas that you want to. Um, uh, then there was the, just like VMware, there's templates on um, Proxmox where you can build your OS and get it uh, hardened and get all the accounts on there that you want to get and the packages you want, then you can uh, turn it into a uh, template. And Proxmox, you can specify different VLANs if you want a production VLAN and a um, test VLAN, you can put that in there. Um, and it does provide a facility if you need to take a node down. If you're patching a node, you can bulk, bulk migrate everything on there. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to, because um, it migrates everything, whether it's running or if it's stopped. Uh, I haven't found a way to migrate something. That I just want to mi migrate my live 
servers, maybe not my servers that are stopped. So uh, I haven't found a way to, uh, to do that. And then there's a tab for the high availability. You can put the state that you want the uh, node in. You can tell it that you want the node to, or the VM to start when your node does. Um, yeah, and then currently I have three separate networks. I have one for the server NIC. I have another separate network for the cluster uh, information that's passed between the different nodes. And then I have one for storage for the um, migrations. And if you're doing a live migration, you do want to check your traffic out to make sure that you're uh, going across the right interface. And I think in the next slide, I think I have how to change that. Yeah, you can go in the data center tab and check options and then check migration settings to make sure you're using the right NIC for doing your, um, your right migrations. So and this is an example of how I kind of build the uh, servers. where I use the uh, ISO to boot with, and then I put all the configuration in there I want for my uh, server, and any packages I want, if I want a Puppet uh, client on there. So I kind of do that in stages. Um, yeah, you know, I guess one of the reasons I was kind of uh, Moving to uh, change my configuration, I couldn't get a Raspberry Pi anymore. So that's why um, you know I started looking at Proxmox, and uh, yeah, I just with my first iteration, I just found three PCs. They were all different. One was ASUS, and um, one was I think it was an old e-machines, um, and one was a homegrown. Uh, server that I found out uh, either had bad firmware but you'd let a VM run on it and it would kind of report in Proxmox that it wasn't getting the CPU time. Uh, I've seen that a lot in uh, VMware but that was the first time I'd seen it in Proxmox so uh, with that PC I thought I'd had a, a bad hard drive that was uh, causing me an issue but it was actually the uh, PC itself and so I thought, well, I'll just keep that in there because I'll, I'll have like a chaos monkey like, uh, like the big shops have. And uh, yeah, you're trying to do things simple so you don't want to add any more headaches to you because that would uh, hang when I was adding patches to the uh, Proxmox server and CorelSync would get unhappy about that. Then I would have to get the CorelSync all synced back up. So. So, yeah, I decided that uh, I didn't need the, need the NAS, so I stole one of my nodes and kind of used that to kind of bear it. I did everything with um, ZFS. So I'm doing ZFS um, pretty much on all, th all three of my uh, primary boxes, uh, the, the NAS, the PFSense, and Proxmox, they all have uh, ZFS running on those. So, and uh, with TrueNAS Core, um, not had any issues with that. That's been uh, rock solid. Everything can be done through the menu. You don't, you can get to the shell if you want to, but um, you never really have to uh, do that. Uh, I mean, I'll jump down to it sometimes to verify the configuration and make sure everything's okay. So, uh, I guess it was early last year, I think. 
Um, I wanted to do more with Proxmox than what I could. I wanted to kind of standardize my equipment. Um, well, I guess this was before I was standard. Yeah, I think this was, uh, I was trying to break fix, so it's like I'll replace that bad PC I got with a Dell Optiplex desktop, but after I got that, I really wanted something that would do IPMI, and, uh, and I didn't really want to use a, I didn't have an extra Raspberry Pi to use that for a console, so, uh, so then I started looking at my next network after, uh, after that, and that's when I found out I also had a problem with my migration. I could do code migration, but I couldn't do the uh, live migration. You know, I'd kind of build it piecemeal, so that part didn't work. So, um, yeah, at the very start of COVID, when everybody everybody got sent home, I uh, called my ISP up to have my uh, network servers upgraded, and uh, they were trying to upgrade that from their office or whatever, and then when they came out, they found out that all my pairs hadn't been punched down, so uh, so I did move up to a gig. And then that's when I noticed my router wasn't really keeping up with the uh, traffic too well, so... Um, yeah, I wanted to do PFSense, but I couldn't get a... Uh, I couldn't get my hands on a net gate to uh, try the commercial version, so I just bought... Um, a super micro from uh, Unix Surplus and um, brought that in and tried that out and that worked great. <coughs> so, and I was planning if, if that didn't work out, I could add other uses for the super micro if that didn't work out, but uh, yeah, it took a while to get into PFSense and look at all the uh, bells and whistles of it, but uh, yeah, I got that, and that was the same time that I was getting the uh, TP-Link switches. So, and I think these are the features I've kind of brought up before. It's it's uh, stable. There's no issues with it. Um, it provides my uh, DNS service for my, uh, my local domain, which is something I didn't have before with a commercial. Um, uh, the GUI has got a lot of bells and whistles to it, and you can add modules to it. And the logging's pretty good, and there's like a debug to kind of crank it up if you need to. And it's like one bu one button to kind of config the backup, and basically I think it tars up your uh, config files. I think it's XML format. So, and this is the TP-Link SG-1080, the switch I went with that was, uh, that does, uh, that's VLAN aware. So, when you're building your home lab infrastructure, uh, you want to decide what, if you're going to copper or fiber, and you want to decide, um, you know, how many bundles you're going to need between the rooms and everything else, and whatever you think you need, you're going to run a few more just to be on the safe side. So, yeah, first I had it in one location, and then uh, I wanted, some of it was kind of noisy, so I wanted to move that down into my basement area, so then, uh, yeah, then I started running more cables to uh, get rid of some of that noise. And I think the super micros that I bought for Proxmox are probably a little bit more on the piggish side, but the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the better ones would have cost me a little bit more. <coughs> Here's the crimper that I got for running my cable, and I like that a lot better than the previous one I had because there wasn't a, any issues with trying to uh, punch down the cables or anything else. You kind of just stick the block in, line up the cables, and punch it, and you're good to go, and you don't have to go back and repunch uh, any cables. So, uh, and depending on what you're doing, you may decide if you need a rack, if you're buying a, some big servers, or 
if you have small servers like Odroid or Raspberry Pi, you don't need anything like that. So, um, but yeah, I didn't want servers with IPMI. I wanted servers that were identical, for all the same parts. Um, you, yeah. And all of my servers right now are one new servers that I'm using. So, and all my, all my NICs on my Proxmox, all my NICs on my TrueNAS, those are all 10 gigabit, but right now my backbone switch is still using the um, VLAN aware switches, which are, those are only one gig. Uh, TP-Link does have a uh, 10 gig switch, but it doesn't do VLANs. Uh, unless you go to business quality, then you can get something like that. But yeah, their standalone 10 gig uh, switch they have, uh, I think it's about $400, but it, it, it will not do VLANs if you needed that. So for what I need, my uh, storage network is standalone, so I don't, uh, I don't really need anything like that. So um, Then when you're starting to push out your uh, servers, the VMs, you know, you got to decide are these going to be long-term, short-term, and that's probably going to determine whether you're going to give them meaningful names or just give them numbers, depending on what you're doing. Um, yeah, then you have your different types of disk. I guess I don't have any SAS disk in my environment right now. Just the EMV, MV, NVMe, and the uh, SATA SSD, and then the spinning hard disk. Uh, PFSense kind of did everything that I wanted to do with the uh, VLANs, and I could spin off my VMs into the right VLAN I wanted to, so I didn't really look at OpenSense. I did see that was used more in the EU, and their appliances were available in the EU. Uh, there is a IP fire that's Linux-based, but I don't have any experience with that. And um, I guess you can actually buy a Sophos and push PFSense onto that, which I haven't tried that. I don't know if I'm going to go that route or not. And I think there's a Protect CLI that kind of uh, does the same thing. Um, And then for, I'm using, like I've said, I'm using TrueNAS, but there is Synology and there's some other uh, competitors to TrueNAS. So, yeah, at the uh, low level, what I've kind of used is Clonezilla if I've needed that. Uh, that's more for repurposing a laptop where I've kind of replaced a disk and I want to go with something a little bit bigger than what I've had before. And then I've got a, a USB SSD drive that I've got uh, Ventoy images loaded onto. Um, Ventoy does get updated from time to time, so you need to go out and kind of check that occasionally. Um, I'm using Tailscale for my uh, mesh VPN to be able to get to uh, to get my net get to get to my network. Um, Let's see, and then of course when you're running a home lab, you're going to be running, wearing a lot of different hats. You know, you're going to be a, like a home assistant administrator. Um, you know, that can suck up all your time. And uh, all these could be, you know, just rabbit holes that you go into and <coughs> it could take you, take you quite a while to come out of them. So, and uh, it is a very similar to having your own little business because you're purchasing all this equipment. You know, you're gonna have to talk to other people in the house before you start making some of these big purchases you're buying. Um, so, yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. <clears throat> and this was uh, yeah, a recap of those other um, 
podcast they've had on Home Lab, the Ansible. See, uh, yeah, I don't guess I have any information about the Ansible Fest 22, but the uh, scale one, that one was uh, more security focused because uh, I know they talked about Security Onion and uh, a couple of different tools with that, so uh, I'd kind of go out and watch that one. And there have been two other uh, uh, presentations. There was the um, um, Network Attached Word yesterday morning by Trey Howard, and then this morning there was uh, the True, ba True NAS by uh, Adam Kennedy where he kind of went into more of the, uh, both of those kind of went into more of the uh, ZFS, kind of talking more about that. So, so and uh, uh, a lot of the uh, Home Lab ideas I've gotten is from all the different podcasts, from the Home Lab show to the Jupiter Broadcasting Suite, the self-hosted Linux Unplugged, Linux Action News, Coder Radio, and you've got the Ask Noah show, which they're right outside uh, the doors. Two and a half admins and BSD Now. Usually both of those are centric more toward uh, usually free BSD, but uh, they have a lot of good information they kind of pass out. And then you've got all the Tux digital podcasts listed there. Uh, then you've got the late night Linux family that keeps expanding. So, uh, I guess Linux Lads, I think that's, uh, those guys are mainly Irish, I believe, and um, they're usually pretty active either every week or every other week also. So, and um, there is a podcast just for Home Assistant if you, <coughs> if you're just focused on that. And then, uh, you know, if you're trying to keep up with security that's going on, there's a five-minute um, podcast every day, except for uh, the weekend, where they uh, give give you the latest and greatest that Sands has kind of found out about that's going around the network. Uh, and here's a couple other miscellaneous ones. So yeah, there was a lot of time in the uh, in the pandemic to uh, listen to podcasts. So, yeah, uh, I usually keep my inventory in a uh, spreadsheet uh, of all the different tools, tools, and then the um, hardware that I'm using. So I want to automate that, but I don't. Uh, I don't have that automated at at the moment. So, yeah, I'm thinking about replacing uh, TrueNAS Core with TrueNAS Scale if I, uh, uh, if I get a new server for that. Uh, I'm hoping to wait on the uh, 10, gig, 10 gigabit switch until they actually have one that's uh, VLAN aware. That's what I'm hoping to kind of wait out on that. Um, I'm using the backups from uh, Proxmox. I'm not using uh, Borg or anything else to do a backup right now, so I, I'm wanting to get a uh, remote solution for that to be able to ZFS replicate that to another uh, location. <coughs> and uh, yeah, I also want to try a Proxmox cluster, uh, a node at another uh, site with uh, tail scale. Um, I've seen some information that's supposed to be uh, possible, but I haven't tried that yet. So. Um, yeah, if you're trying to look for old laptops, there's um, govdeals.com. You can go out there and kind of bid on uh, bid on equipment. Uh, to kind of replace some of your equipment, and uh, there's no guarantee about what you're going to get. It may it may work, it may uh, may not. You may have to invest in it, or you may ha end up having to throw it away. Um, 
Let's see, I was monitoring previously with Proxmox. Currently, I don't have that uh, going right now. I don't uh, have a need for that, but um, I do want to, if my production gets more um, involved, then I'll probably uh, look at putting Proxmox back, or putting uh, Nagios back out there. And I've looked a little bit at Greylog and at Elk, and I haven't decided which way I'm going to go with that. And uh, yeah, Proxmox 8 was uh, was released yesterday in beta. Uh, they also have a Proxmox mail gateway. Uh, that looks like it has a lot of um, fancy GUI to it to be able to kind of look at a lot of metrics. And I thought about just testing that within my own domain, but uh, restricting any d mail from leaving my domain. Uh, uh, those are some tools listed there that um, have been mentioned on, well, except for ATOP. ATOP, I've, I've had that uh, installed s um, for, for uh, probably about four or five years now since that came out. But, uh, you know, the G-Ping looks pretty, uh, pretty slick because that runs in a terminal window. The, the uh, browser runs there inside a terminal window. And then the uh, Dua runs, I think, in, I haven't tested the Dua yet, but I've tested the, uh, the others. Uh, here's my uh, contact information. Is there uh, any questions? So you covered what's in your lab. What are you giving to, or what, what are you using the equipment for in your house? What, are you, what sort of services are you running for your, the rest of the family? Um, I have Jellyfin, I'm running Jellyfin. That's, uh, yeah, that's one production that I have. Um, a lot of it is for sysadmin things. I kind of want to uh, just test something out so I can spin up um, a lot of different rail configs with uh, STIG requirements and you know harden the servers and things like that so and then I have Ansible and I have um, Puppet with Hira that I'm using so I'm kicking the tires between those two to see I've done Puppet in the past but I'm switching more to Ansible and I'm going back and forth between those two so Oh, and then I have the uh, home assistant that's uh, that's just controlling some of my uh, light bulbs and TVs, things like that. So, yeah. Govdeals.com. G O V Govdeals.com. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, actually, when you go to that one, you see other sites within that one or whatever. Uh, if you're lucky enough to live next to a university, you, you'll, you can probably clean up. I have a HP design jet in my basement right now. So, so but it's costing me a fortune to. Uh, replace all the parts in it <laughs> so <laughs> so anything else all right thank you
Thank <laughs> you. 